I think maybe we're ready to go um, and um, people will still be joining, I'm sure. But um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Melissa de Carbonell, Crisis Group's Deputy Program Director for the Europe and Central Asia Program. I'm coming to you from my home in Brussels, and I'm really delighted to have such an expert crowd joining us for this discussion of our report on Turkish ISIS returnees. As you know, the International Crisis Group is an independent organization working to prevent and mitigate deadly conflict. All of our reports are based on extensive field research, and I really have to say this one is no exception. Our Turkey project director, Nagar Gerksal, and analyst Berkay Mandarije even continued interviewing returnees and other stakeholders remotely amid the lockdown of the last few months. So Dr. Daniel Byman, senior fellow at the Brookings Center of Middle East Policy and author of Road Warriors, a book on foreign fighters, will be bringing his wealth of experience to the discussion today as well. And each of our panelists will speak for a few minutes and then we'll open the floor or the ethernet as it were to discussion. I'm sure that most of you know the drill by now, but a couple quick rules of the road. If you wanna ask a question, there's a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Please, please also remember to write your name and affiliation. I'm really sorry, but I'm gonna, you're gonna to have to forgive me ahead of time if I don't know all 200 some people here and or trip over any of your names. Do indicate if you want to ask a question live. We have an option to go audio only, and I think we should have some time to unmute a few people. Please also note that the event is being recorded. So without further ado, I'll hand the floor to Nagar. Thanks a lot, Alisa. So I'll talk a little bit about why we think this is a relevant topic, even though uh, for the last three and a half years, there hasn't been an ISIS attack in Turkey. And also talk about how we see the state policy, security policy in particular, having uh, evolved in the last few years. So as many of you know, Turkey is one of the countries from which um, uh, the highest number of nationals uh, travel to Syria and Iraq to join ISIS estimated to be between 5,000 and, and 9,000 people. It's also where some of the most deadly ISIS attacks took place, killing nearly uh, 300 individuals in total. And actually a majority of those were killed in attacks that were perpetrated by uh, Turkish nationals who were returnees. Of the few thousand that, at least minimum, that have returned, only a fraction of them are in prison. And most of them are in prison for charges of terror, member, terror organization membership, which keeps them in jail for three, four years. Like is the case in many other countries, uh, the uh, evidence that people committed other crimes uh, in Syria is often lacking for, for Turkish prosecutors uh, as well. Um, but unlike in other countries, more Turkish nationals may have dodged prosecution by being able to say, and we, we ran into this in a number of court cases and actually returnees themselves, to say that they had joined uh, Turkish-backed rebels in, in Syria, that's why they were there, or that they'd taken aid, for example, to the Turkmans. So um, that phenomenon may have taken place more in Turkey. Some returnees we talked to had returned to their home communities. We met some that said they'd been congratulated there um, by, their, by their environment. Uh, we, women seem mostly have gone and return back to their families, particularly if they lost their husband in Syria, back to their mother and father's homes. And then we met some returnees who had sort of been shunned or rejected by their communities and decided to start a fresh page, a uh, fresh start uh, in a big city. So they had moved to, to um, Istanbul or other, other cities. Um, men we talked to uh, did speak fondly of, the, of their years, particularly 2014 and 15. Uh, living under ISIS, and they expressed this continued interest in the ideal of a caliphate, but none seem to be poised by any means towards um, stripping on, a, on a, a suicide vest and conducting an attack. That being said, those who might be prone in that way probably wouldn't be um, giving us an interview. Uh, Turkish state officials tend to think that Turkish returnees are more likely to safely integrate into society compared to um, at least European returnees. They think that more Turks went uh, for opportunistic reasons, for, for money, for uh, wealth, for adventure, for find a purpose or to um, guarantee a pleasant afterlife, let's say. Um, Officials say that this conviction of theirs is based on surveys in, in, of prison inmates and um, their surveillance of returnees. So I guess that also includes their phone conversations and whatnot. So what kind of a life they're living now is being monitored sometimes um, in ways that the returnees themselves don't seem to know. 
A minority um, of returnees, the Turkish state still thinks is ideologically committed to the cause for which they generally think that nothing can be done besides um, constant surveillance. But there are five ways uh, broadly that we think the Turkish security sector has, uh, has uh, gone about um, uh, patching together the information needed to keep the threat under control. Heavy surveillance of suspects, databases seized during raids, which has been significant, and the active remorse clause, which is uh, that many apparently ISIS returnees, in order to get reduced sentences, gave a good bit of information about other people that had joined the ISIS and its functionings, its structure, its method methodology, and whatnot. Um, and then there's also a significant amount of infiltration we see into both ISIS um, and the smuggler rings um, by the Turkish security sector. So sometimes people think that they came into Turkey undetected, but via the smugglers, um, uh, their, their whereabouts can be known. And then there's the short-term detentions that we see being carried out um, uh, towards people that uh, during their first contact with ISIS operatives, that supposedly this would scare them uh, to sort of know that the state is actually following them and they're not, um, they're not going to get away with it. Um, these types of measures we see have enabled the police and intelligence forces, uh, services, particularly since 2016, uh, mid-2016, to keep under check the threat. Um, uh, I mean, there are different reasons that government officials and, and the critics of the government will uh, cite regarding why attacks didn't take place, took place before and, and didn't later. Um, but the Turkish officials will mostly say that it took time to get a handle on how, the, how ISIS functions and how to track down the key operatives. It's not something that can happen overnight. All the sort of list that I just uh, set, set forth um, is something that took some time. They also will say that the chain of command of the state bureaucracy improved after the, the coup attempt. But critics, critics will underline rather the sort of negligence of police and, and prosecutors, uh, particularly in 2015, and they'll say that um, the sort of the targets of ISIS were more um, more of interest to the Turkish state uh, in 2016 when ISIS started attacking Turkish police headquarters and um, tourist locations, which had implications for the economy and whatnot. Um, while we do commend the improved state security um, uh, work. We do also say that there is not room for complacence, and I'll outline four reasons for that, and then um, I'll be ending then. Um, one is, a, is that plots are still being foiled. So, um, you know, obviously ISIS, there's still attempts, or at least reportedly, um, uh, ongoing, and no amount of surveillance is ultimately completely foolproof. The second one is that just like veterans of past mobilizations of jihadi mobilizations, um, played key roles in ISIS, the veterans of ISIS could very well um, also be drawn in if ISIS resurges or if um, another jihadi um, uh, militant outfit comes about. Uh, thirdly, uh, we see, of course, the risk always that m more numbers of jihadi militants could flow in from Idlib, uh, depending on how the conflict there uh, evolves. And finally, um, Turkey is yet to have systematically assessed the reasons people went and, and what they're doing now, which is a point that um, uh, my colleague Darkai will be elaborating on his, in his presentation. So I'll hand the floor directly to him. Thank you so much, Nigar. So I'll be talking about the what should be done aspect of things, which actually was the part that we grappled with the most while writing this report. When we asked Turkish officials what they were doing beyond security measures in terms of social policies, um, usually the answer we got was um, um, a list of initiatives um, whose scope and direction was not really clearly defined. So uh, they would not differentiate, for example, between prevention and uh, reintegration. Uh, the target of the policies they were formulating listing to us was not clear sometimes they would lump together different groups they uh, designated as terrorists into one category and would uh, assume that lump sum solutions could be possible for them um, and then there was also no coordination among the different units among the different state agencies that we saw um, had to try to develop some uh, policies in this area um, Therefore, it would, first of all, I mean, would be helpful to clarify the aims of these um, initiatives, um, but what, what, whatever is existing right now, and also develop measures or matrices 
to be able to measure their effectiveness. And that is actually a big issue also in other contexts. And often, you know, social measures have not really produced the results that they intended to. They have not been effective. In, in some countries, the results were mixed. So that's why it is very important to first have more clarity about what is aimed with the measures that are being um, worked on. And secondly, there needs to be more consciousness about what measures can be developed um, to measure sort of their effectiveness. Um, what, mm, what we've seen in other contexts and what uh, was missing in Turkey was, for example, the categorization of returnees, sort of trying to understand uh, or group them together according to either the risk factors or the needs um, that would be required um, to help make them sort of or, or, or help them integrate into society safely. And there again, you know, obviously this can could apply, for example, for returnees who have gone through the uh, criminal justice system, um, an analysis of their return, their recruitment dynamics, the motivations that led them to join ISIS in the first place, um, why they returned, how long they stayed in Syria or Iraq, and um, uh, why, why they returned. All of these factors could be uh, made part of that uh, sort of analysis of the returning profiles in general. Of course, any state attempt in that regard um, um, to engage returnees is bound to be problematic because, again, as many people that we talk to, um, they see the state as taut. So they think the state in general is infidel, um, they, they, that they don't trust the state. Um, and there is, in general, there is um, uh, a rejection of the state's authority even among some groups. So it's very hard for any state intervention to work. Um, and then, I mean, the state, the Turkish state also at the local level, especially, does not have the capacity, has not developed capacity to uh, address the needs of returnees. Uh, we talked to various actors on the ground, and usually the response we got was that um, they would not feel responsible to uh, take, um, take a proactive role in this area. Um, Turkey also stands out as a country where civil society is largely absent in this field of uh, de-radicalization, disengagement. Um, and again, you know, many of the groups that we thought could have a potential that we talked to said they just think that security should be in the forefront and they didn't see, they didn't see a role for themselves. But this does not mean that, you know, social policy should be discounted uh, totally. Um, I think there's, there's still worth in sort of exploring what can be done with them and how much they can actually complement uh, security uh, uh, measures. Um, many, many states right now are in exploring mode uh, and Turkey is not as much. Um, so thinking about these issues in a more systematic way and in a targeted way may, may help. Um, I think this is, I mean, it's also important in terms of, you know, which resources should be de dedicated to which areas, because obviously CT related resources are limited. So if there are areas, social policies that were developed and that, that, that didn't work out, um, it doesn't make sense to invest even more resources into that area. So uh, it, it will help to uh, sort of filter out the policies that work, that have some potential to work and that didn't work. So there are two areas, two policy areas that we uh, thought might be worth exploring in, in, in Turkey, um, to sort of do this policy exploration more. One is after release programs for uh, returnees who have been imprisoned. And usually, as Nia already said, um, returnees get prison sentences or you know, they are jailed for three to four years approximately. Um, and you know, there are also others who are um, um, tried, you know, who are pending trial who are released pending trial, others who uh, are released pending their appeal decisions, and appeal decisions take really long in Turkey. I mean, because of the overload for the judiciary, we, for example, met one returnee who was waiting for his appeal decision for two years already. So that's a, a period where some intervention or where some policies may have the chance of success. Um, you know, this could, for example, involve more work with families. We met a lot of families on the ground uh, who said, you know, they that they didn't know how to approach their relatives who were imprisoned or who were released after a certain period of imprisonment. So as much as, you know, that is a demand coming from the families, um, authorities could reach out to them and um, try to help families, um, um, provide them with guidance on how to bring back their family members into uh, a safe family environment. The second area is the preventive area um, where, you know, Turkish officials, again, have developed certain policies, but they are not targeted. 
Um, so there, you know, again, some policies could be trialed, uh, maybe possibly uh, in the area of uh, what support can be extended to youth who are prone to be um, drawn into jihadist militancy. The recruitment hubs that we sort of saw in 2014-15 may be a good sort of location to start these initiatives or look into what can be done in terms of improving capacities, um, local local level capacities especially. But again, there is no there is no definitive solution, and you know these preventive measures again um, in other contexts they have all also been uh, used for other for, for other purposes. Some people, I mean, and you know, especially. In, in contexts where uh, they have led to um, mistrust um, by returnees or by people who were targeted by these policies, um, um, have not really produced the desired outcome. Um, and but but still, I mean, these I think it, it's important to think about these uh, policies uh, also to sort of forestall possible new recruitment cycles or at least keep the scale of new recruitment if it were to come about um, under control. So to conclude, um, as we said, I mean, the security measures the Turkish state has put in place have worked to keep uh, ISIS um, operatives and returnees under check, but there are still risks and it's not a foolproof strategy. Exploring um, in targeted and systematic ways what social policies um, can, uh, can complement that security approach could still be worthwhile, although one needs to tread very carefully. Um, and I mean, our recommendations in this report are very modest, and I think policymakers and decision makers also have to be very modest in uh, what they can actually achieve with these types of social policies. And you know, each step needs to be assessed very carefully, uh, needs to be measured also very carefully, so that um, um, the policies implemented do not cause more trouble. So I would leave it, leave, leave it at that, and I'll be happy to um, go into more detail um, during the Q&A session. Um, Elisa, back to you. Thank you, Nagar and Berkay. I mean, I think part of uh, your discussion just uh, shows how underexplored and how much more policy thinking is needed in this area. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn to Dr. Uh, Dan Byman. Um, when we were speaking ahead of this event, he mentioned um, that the situation in Turkey surrounding returnees is, is perhaps better um, than some experts had feared it would be a few years ago. Um, so I'd like to ask him now to share his thoughts on why that may be um, and how Turkish uh, policy now in Iraq and Syria may weigh on the longer term uh, security situation. Thank you very much, Alyssa. And let me begin by really complimenting the crisis group and especially the authors on a, a truly fantastic report. Um, as you said, uh, this report answers a lot of questions about Turkey's situation with regard to the returnees. If you go way back to 2012, 2013, when the Syria conflict is unfolding, uh, Turkey is really part of the problem. It's a country that is allowing the easy transit of fighters, uh, some Turks, but many foreigners, to the front, and they're joining an array of groups, including groups that become the Islamic State, but also an array of other fighting groups, some of which are more moderate, some of which are more radical, as part of the regime's effort against the Assad regime. And it is um, a sort of situation that is causing frustration in many Western capitals, and not surprisingly, by 2015, we start to see this boomerang back on Turkey itself, where you see significant and quite bloody attacks by the Islamic State using the same networks they had established to bring people into Syria. They're now sending people out of Syria and doing attacks in Turkey itself that cause huge problems for the Turkish state. Uh, in 2017, when the caliphate starts to really fall apart, there's tremendous concern that Turkey is going to be either the next base for the Islamic State, or I think more realistically, the next victim. That because it's next door to Syria, you'll see lots of people flowing across the border. Because it has these networks in place, you'll see the logistic center of the movement moving to Turkey. And there's tremendous concern that we're gonna see a lot of violence in Turkey and a lot of violence from Turkey. And as the report makes very clear, this doesn't happen. Right? And the authors go into some detail as why this is likely so, but it's, it's really a success of policing and intelligence. And this is impressive of the Turkish state. 
Um, and it shows the effectiveness of these measures, not just in the short term, but really over the medium term. And we'll see how long they last, but nevertheless, uh, very impressive. Uh, but it's also important to know that the Islamic State itself has become weaker, that the group today in 2020 is not what the group was in 2015, that it has a lot less money, fewer recruits, the constant pressure has made it harder for it to do even regional attacks, let alone international attacks. And that's taking a toll on the group. So when we think about the future danger, we need to recognize not only is the, Tur the Turkish state more aggressive, but the group itself is weaker. Um, on a big question mark, though, is going to be what happens in Syria. Um, the US role is diminishing. And there's a question mark about how long it's going to endure, even if there is a change in administration. Um, in the United States. Um, and of course, the Turkish role is, um, if anything, growing. And this isn't primarily directed against the Islamic State, but Turkey is going to be playing a role in the uh, battle against the Islamic State remnants in Syria simply because it's there. And part of it will attract the enmity of the group, but also its proximity means there's going to be a lot of pressure on Turkey to take action. Um, it also makes it more likely that the Islamic State will prioritize Turkey, but perhaps do so in Syria itself, that there might be a greater threat, but the threat might not be so much marketplaces um, and cities in Turkey itself, but um, that it might be Turkish soldiers or forces that are stationed in Syria. Um, this is the, qu the question mark for many people on the Islamic State is, is there going to be a sustained effort in Syria to continue to go after group remnants? And one possibility is that Turkey might play a leading role in this. But another is that Turkey's prioritization of what it sees as a Kurdish threat, that the potential conflicts between Syria and Turkey, between with Russia involved, that all this actually might produce more chaos. And that actually might be an opportunity for the Islamic State to have greater freedom of action, to be able to reconstitute itself, to be able to portray itself as an ally. So one of the big question marks, I think, for Turkey, but really for the region, is going to be the future of Syria. And there's a question mark, which is, does Turkey really have a long-term strategy in mind for what it's trying to accomplish there? And we will see in the coming months and years. Thank you. Um, so with that, I think I'd like to open up for discussion. Um, a quick reminder, as much as I would prefer to have you all in one room, um, please write um, whatever questions you may have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and I will do my best to group them and direct them to people. Um, also, if you can write your name and affiliation um, and or if you would like to ask your question live, um, and we can also do that. Um, at the moment, I see there's silence. So people are thinking about um, what, uh, what they've just heard. Um, oh, and here we go. So this is a question for Nagar. Um, it's quite specific. It's about the, um, the admissibility of evidence in, um, um, in court. Um, has there been any specific uh, legislation enacted or changes? Um, I know we've seen in a lot of other places in the world um, a very a shift in approach um, to how um, people are able to be prosecuted on terrorist related crimes. Um, so if you could speak to that, um, there's a question from Vladimir Kiev Roshev. Thank you. Uh, there haven't been any changes in the legislation, but I must say Turkey had a little bit of an advantage to other countries because of its sort of outposts in Syria and some of them within Turkish controlled territories in Syria. So um, I think in the field in Syria as well, Turkey had more of an ability to both collect and process um, uh, evidence from the field. That being said, no, um, uh, there haven't been any um, any change, uh, legal changes to um, to be able to uh, use intelligence evidence, for example, by itself. It has to be complemented by evidence that's that's collected um, legally in, in other ways. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to go to Anna Rees um, from the European External Action Service to ask her question live. We can do that. Excuse us, we're all yeah. dealing with it. 
Yeah. Perfect. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for your briefing. Um, I just want to say, uh, uh, as regards uh, prevention, also reintegration, resocialization. So we work uh, the external action server with Turkey on collaboration on CT. My uh, strong feeling is that Turkey has not been that interested really in this sector. We we have uh, suggested several peer-to-peer -peer experts discussions. Uh, we've had some uh, also. So whilst I agree with, with Daniel, they have very robust uh, intelligence and police force in dealing with terrorism on the softer side of things, both as regards reintegration, resocialization, also in particular when it comes to returnees who are then released from prison going back to perhaps where they came from, this is where we in the EU at least feel there is a great need to ensure support to those communities and ensure that you don't fall back into the same pattern or risk group, uh, not only with intelligence and monitoring, but also the softer size with social services, with school teachers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whilst we used to say this is uh, new, it's not so new anymore. We've all been in this game for quite some time now, so, so many countries are learning on prevention, online radicalization, and now more and more reintegration. And again, I'd like to also emphasize, like Turkey, it's not new for them to our probation services and have to, to channel prisoners for non-terrorist related crimes, organized crime, etc., into society. You don't drop a guy who's been sitting in jail for 15 years into society without some follow-up. And I think this um, is something I'm sure, I'm quite sure Turkey has plenty of experience from, and it's the same method you can apply, of course, here. This is a, a chain of different roads from, from probation services down to, to the local communities. I just want to make this point that the interest hasn't been huge and we will continue to pursue this in relationship with, with Turkey. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for that intervention. Um, I don't know if, Berkar, you want to add a couple of words on that? This is what you addressed in the beginning mm -hmm. of your... Sure. Yeah, I mean, thank you very much for this intervention. And that's exactly what we also came across when we talked to Turkish officials especially the after-release programs, we were quite surprised that there were none, um, or there was only very little deliberation about, um, about, about that, um, especially also given that many you know, ISIS returnees are being tried uh, pending trial, or they are being re released after um, uh, waiting for their appeal decisions to, to, to finalize. Um, so hopefully our report is going to make a contribution to think about these issues uh, potentially and um, maybe also bring, bring, bring this issue, uh, these issues up with um, uh, Turkish officials. Okay, thank you. We have two questions here that are on a related subject um, from the Q&A. So I, um, they're actually questions about um, uh, foreigners um, who have transited through Turkey or maybe in Turkey. Um, and one of the questions about the level of willingness of Turkey to repatriate these citizens um, from uh, Turkey to whatever countries might uh, take them back. And another question about um, whether there's a different approach to foreigners and uh, Turkish uh, returnees, um, if I'm gonna summarize those. Uh, perhaps I'll start and then yeah. Rekai can, can complement. Uh, to start, the end, is there a different approach? I mean, I think by and large, there's a sense that the Turkish citizens are, are, are here to stay and they have family and communities that they can be reintegrated in. I don't think the same thinking of, of, of the need to rehabilitate and reintegrate people would be um, the case for, for foreigners. So I think it's much more security oriented. And that being said, like we underlined, they're not, it's not that there are a lot of um, uh, softer policies designed for Turks either, but there's more interest in it um, compared to foreigners. As far as repatriation goes, yes, I think Turkey is very interested in getting rid of as many of, 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 the, of the foreign uh, ISIS militants as it possibly can and is very, um, uh, you know, complains a lot about 
um, about being stuck with them because with the with the capacity as limited as it is in Turkey and both prosecution and uh, whatever soft measures uh, that might be thought up, uh, the police and intelligence as well. You know that it's a lot of work already with its own citizens, and I think um, I think Turkey is eager to um, uh, to not also have to um, uh, deal with the foreigners. That's my my take. And maybe you can say one word about the collaboration issue. I think one of the reasons that Turkey, at least that we hear, is not as, as forthcoming on collaboration on ISIS is because they expect also, they say, well, we have to talk about PKK, we have to talk about FETA, and you know, we'll, we'll get to ISIS third, but first, first, why don't you collaborate on those two? And I think that somehow um, uh, poisons at least discussions um, about, about the ISIS-related CT collaboration or soft policies. One other thing that may be taking place is that if there are no, if there are no really effective soft policies in place, then that might not be um, something that they also want to share. It, it, it might, they might not just have enough effective policies in this area to, to want to reveal. Thanks. I mean, Dan, do you have to, do you want to add anything on uh, Turkey's cooperation with the EU or um, for that matter, DC on, on uh, foreign fighters? Um, there's a couple of questions about that, but if I were to, to add to what we've heard. Uh, sure. So just to, to start, the, the foreigners who are in Turkey or elsewhere, uh, they tend to be both more dangerous and more vulnerable uh, because unlike uh, the Turks, they can't simply go back into their previous roles in society. They don't have societal constraints. They were often more committed in the first place, which is why they did a longer journey. Um, so they're a high um, danger category, but also they stand out, right? They don't have the local connections. They can be more easily spotted. They're not protected by family or friendship. Uh, so there's a real intelligence potential and Turkey has been very aggressive against them. Uh, we have to be very careful here when we talk about Europe because uh, most of the intelligence and law enforcement is not EU, but European state. And so you have EU efforts, but you also have efforts by states that are often more important from the state's point of view. And there's tremendous variation on this, right? So to use the word Europe in any sense on this is a bit misleading because the policies of Germany and the policies of France are completely different. And some are very geared towards reintegration and human rights, and some are very geared towards um, killing people or at least putting them in jail for quite some time. Some European states are willing to take back their own citizens and others are going through elaborate efforts to strip them of citizenship or otherwise really avoid the responsibility that they should show. And so Turkey is often caught in the middle of a lot of this where it's facing contradictory pressures uh, and also a fair degree of hypocrisy from a number of European states. Thank you. Um, we have another um, person who would like to ask a question live. We have Natalia. Mirimanova um, from uh, the Eurasia Peace Initiative. Um, I think she's there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your report. I will read it uh, with great interest because I just completed a big, big study about the perception of returning foreign fighters in the Western Balkans in the entire region. And I can relate to, to many of the, of the conclusions that you've um, come up with. One, one thing that I would like to ask is about the internal ethnic uh, and political divisions and how the issue of returnees maps onto that. To give you an example, like in Bosnia, you have foreign fighters who go to ISIS, but also those who go to fight in Ukraine on the, on the side of the Russians. And sure enough, the, the perception of these two groups is very different, including the legal consequences, although the law is sort of one for all. Do you know of, of the cases, or is it discussed the cases of Kurds from Turkey? going to fight in Syria on, on the side of the, so to speak, right side of, of, against ISIS, because we know that there were quite a group from departing from Germany to join them. And are they considered foreign fighters? And, and what kind of legal uh, prosecution are they facing in Turkey? Or is it a taboo question and no one discusses that? Thank you. I, uh, let me try to tackle that question if I understood it correctly. Um, and if I didn't, I think perhaps you did. Now, I mean, in terms of ethnic cleavages, it's interesting because the Kurds within themselves, I don't think we can say Kurds versus Turks on that because the Kurds 
around half of them um, uh, support the Kurdish movement, which I guess if we're talking about Syria would be the YPG um, side of, uh, of the conflict. And then half of them are, are well, I can't say half of them are Islamists, but they're also Kurds that are, are very anti-Kurdish um, uh, movement and, and many of them are Islamist Kurds. So we see actually proportional to the population of Kurds, more uh, the, the, the rate of joining ISIS was, was higher than if you look at ethnic Turks. That's what at least we were told. Um, so Kurds both joined, I guess, um, I, I don't know the numbers, but you'll have Kurds on both sides of the conflict in Syria. So Kurds within ISIS, Turkish national Kurds, and then uh, Kurds uh, that would be joining the ranks of YPG supposedly. Um, uh, are they treated like foreign fighters? I don't think they're, I mean, if they joined ISIS, they're treated the same as a Turkish, any other Turkish national. Um, and if they have joined YPG, of course, if they're known to have joined YPG, then they would also yeah, definitely be treated <laughs> like a, um, uh, uh, I mean, go through the, 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 the prosecution and, 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 and um, jailing processes. I don't know whether I answered the question actually. Back, I would you like that. Make a small addition. Yes. So, um, yeah, exactly. I mean, I, but ethnically, it's difficult to divide it. But I think there are historically entrenched grievances or entrenched groups that um, have um, where people have been motivated to, especially take to Syria or Syria most mostly to fight against um, uh, PK or the YPG, especially. Um, and uh, the Kobani incidents in 2014, as we described in the report as well, were a rallying cry for many of them. Um, there were protests, as you probably know, uh, in 2014, um, October. And that, according to some returnees that we were able to access, um, they said that at that moment, you know, was the time when they felt they needed to join because um, they were seeing, you know, their brothers and sisters, as they were saying it, um, um, being, being, fought against um, by the YPG there. So, you know, those sort of historically entrenched um, um, groupings and grievances, um, especially between sort of the affiliates of Kurdish Hezbollah uh, in Turkey and the PKK, um, they all played also into recruitment dynamics, um, um, as far as we could, we could tell from the access we got in the field. Thank you. I'm, um, I'm going to group a couple of these questions. And so sorry if I don't shout out to each of you, um, but there's uh, some overlap here. Um, we've had a few questions on the differentiation between um, ISIS and members of other um, designated terror groups um, in Turkey. Um, there's you know, so I, I, I wonder if Nagar could elaborate a little bit more on the difference in approach. Um, and there's a specific question about um, the, um, how reliable do you find media reports on, um, on different arrests? Um, and um, the, sorry, I'm just reading this out now. Um, the, and how reliable are the estimates on the actual numbers of ISIS suspects um, present or active? Or arrested in Turkey. So, um, Nagar, if you'll speak to the differentiation, and I don't know if um, if Dan and or Berkay want to jump in on the um, estimates of foreign fighters and Turkish fighters. Yeah, uh, I mean, we we did talk to returnees who um, had gone to join ISIS, but they were a little late, so they um, decided to stick with HDS. And of course, there were some that um, uh, had joined ISIS and then uh, moved moved westwards and um, joined the ranks of HDS. And there were criticism within one of the returnees we talked to was mad at the people that had joined uh, HDS after ISIS, saying this opportunistic people just going where they where the power and the money is, and you know they should have stayed dedicated to ISIS. Um, so there is, I mean, there, there, there has been some fluidity. That being said, um, uh, you know, HDS doesn't pose a direct threat to Turkey uh, today. And so, you know, when we, and, and we focused on ISIS in our, in our research, we did actually meet a couple of people who were um, uh, prosecuted for membership um, of, of HDS. So, um, and HDS is considered a, a terror organization by Turkey. So, I, I don't, uh, you know, I don't think we can come to a general conclusion. But we do see, of course, that that um, there have been um, uh, people um, uh, that that let's say recycled uh, recycled from one to from one to the other. Um, uh, I think I'll leave it at that. 
was there another question, Alyssa, to me, or the rest of the questions? Were? Sorry, I was I was basically grouping those questions um, about the fluidity between groups and the Turkish state's um, sort of approach to different terror groups. Uh, Dan, did you want to jump on on that? I'll only add on the on the numbers question. Uh, I think that Nigar raises to me a huge point, which is uh, when you have fluidity among groups, who is counted for what is often, you know, there's a certain degree of subjectivity to it. Uh, in most states, it's actually a very political question because some groups are more acceptable than others. And so whether you want to estimate higher, estimate low, it depends on the politics of the moment. Um, and many of these numbers come directly or indirectly from government. And governments at times have reasons to overcount and at times have reasons usually to undercount. Uh, so I would say that while it's worth trying to gather and analyze numbers, we should also recognize the limits uh, to some of the data we're studying. Right, and I will say that if you do look to the report, there are extensive footnotes and annexes that speak to the difficulties of uh, the data and the sources that um, Berka and Nagar have gone to for that. Um, we've had two questions about where um, specifically um, some of the returnees were from and what communities and also how they've been received by communities when they came back. Um, Berkai, would you like to take that one? Yes, sure. So uh, where they were from, I mean, that question, uh, we tried to dig in a bit more. Um, and there we saw that, especially in some ultra conservative um, or ultra biased neighborhoods of some, uh, the, of some um, uh, cities in Turkey, across Turkey, by the way, so we cannot really say, well, there were more from this region or that region. Uh, recruitment happened from across Turkey. There were some neighborhoods where it happened more. Um, not necessarily because of the nature of those neighborhoods or because they were um, impoverished or, or whatnot, but sometimes it was just a, a charismatic recruiter who had gone to the, that neighborhood. Who, you know, ob obviously there may have been vulnerabilities that played into sort of the factors of them being recruited, uh, but it, it was very hard for us to sort of, we, we tried to look for patterns and, and sometimes, you know, people were telling us, well, you know, this area was an area that urbanized recently. We had a lot of migration from rural areas to this district in the last 20 years. And that led to people becoming, uh, losing their identity, looking for identity, looking for a cause. But then when we went to other neighborhoods where the exact similar things happened, we didn't see much recruitment. So, you know, it seems that it was more related to people, to recruiters themselves, um, that people um, joined from some areas more than, more than others. Upon their return, um, Again, a very mixed picture. Um, some people went back to the neighbor neighborhoods that they actually were recruited from. Um, and they, some of them were also embraced by their family members or by, the, by their neighbors or community members. There were some people who said, well, I was congratulated when I came back, even by people that I, that I didn't know before. So that sort of gave us the impression that this might also be going on in some, in some uh, areas. But then there were others who said, well, I mean, I, I turned my back on my family members and my social circles because I wanted to put a distance to ISIS and jihadist militancy. So I just uh, traveled to, to, to uh, an area where I could just blend in and you know, get a job, get married, et cetera, and return to normal. And then yet there were also others um, who would um, simply, you know, who, who, who would simply get lost in certain, in certain neighborhoods in sort of the bigger cities uh, of Turkey. So the, so the profiles have been really sort of the dynamics of return have been uh, quite ver varied and it's very hard to sort of um, come to a, a generalize a conclusion about, you know, how returnees in Turkey now fare. It's a very mixed picture um, and that's why it's also very difficult to sort of have general or lump sum policy uh, solutions for uh, this diverse um, um, group of people. Okay, I mean, I think um, th that that brings us right to another question that we had um, um, from Duruk Ergun. Um, and I will remind you all that if you would like to ask a question live or if you would like me to state your affiliation, you should write it in the Q&A. Otherwise, I will have a difficult time knowing. Um, but there's been uh, two questions about um, the prevention, rehabilitation, reintegration side of things. Um, which agencies specifically um, could be engaged in this role and in what capacity? Um, so if you can elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, 
Claire Kai, I, I don't Nisha? know if you want to follow from where you were discussing. Uh, should I continue, Nika? Or you can no, also... Go ahead. Okay. I'll, I'll add something if I feel yeah. like I need. Okay, sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, th this was also an issue we obviously delved into uh, deeply and we tried to talk to all relevant, and we actually talked to all relevant um, agencies to sort of attribute a role for themselves in this uh, area. Um, we went to the Dianet, for example, Turkey's religious authority, uh, and they seem to be sort of in the forefront uh, of the work, especially in terms of counter narratives, etc. Um, and, you know, but, but again, when we talked to others who had assessed the Dianet's role in this uh, work, they were saying that the Dianet doesn't, doesn't have the capacity, especially at the local level. And, you know, since the Dianet is being seen as a state institution, returnees themselves they reject any sort of interaction or engagement with the Anit Imams, for example, at the local level. So it's very, I mean, as I explained during my presentation, it's very hard for any state institution to get involved. Uh, the family ministry, we, we thought, um, um, could uh, play a more proactive role in this area when we talk to uh, people in the, in the ministry. Um, they said they, you know, think that the security bureaucracy or the security services should be at the forefront and they would only take a proactive role if Mandate, mandated so by security officials, um, which, you know, again, doesn't really speak to sort of the, the, the exact role they sort of uh, found, found for, for themselves. They're, they were tasked with um, supporting 200 or so children who were brought back from Iraqi prisons to Turkey in mid-2019 but they wouldn't uh, share information with us on that. Um, so we weren't able to sort of dive into the details of that program if there were psychosocial support uh, extended to uh, these children or women, we weren't able to find out. Um, um, yeah, so that I think sort of for prisons especially, I think the justice ministry is sort of the agency that would be in charge. Um, um, to, and then obviously for the more social aspects um, or exploring at, at least social policies, the uh, Dianet family ministry would be um, uh, two agencies that um, would need to be consulted uh, or would need to um, um, be brought into the fold or into the process. Nia, is there anything I missed? No, but I might take the opportunity to say that it was interesting to us when we talked to all these ministries um, or agencies that they, they all had sort of an underestimation of the agency of women. So when they were th speaking about the kind of policies that they might want to devise for women, it was always about sort of um, uh, so psychosocial health, PTSD related support and um, like uh, so seeing them very much as victims that, that maybe um, had bad experiences. Um, whereas, I mean, the, we realized there were some men that had also gone with, 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 with idealistic uh, uh, thoughts and then also got sort of traumatized there. So maybe they also need to be seen. Uh, that gender discrimination, that uh, di differentiation was a little bit too stark. And we also knew that there were women um, who convinced their brothers to go with them to join ISIS. You know, they may be a minority. The Turkish officials may be right that, you know, a, a vast majority of them were not like that. But we, we, we ran into cases and stories of, of women who had also taken uh, uh, an active um, uh, role in, in, in propagating ideology or, or, or are playing a role in an aspect of an attack. So, um, you know, one of our uh, one of our suggestions to um, to these ministries was also not to separate men and women so um, starkly. Um, we've had a lot of questions about one of the main um, uh, policy lines of the report, which is you know reintegration, rehabilitation, and what kind of policies we can do around there. And um, as um, as one of our um, uh, participants here, uh, and Arias asked at the beginning, pointed out these are not new in a lot of places. Um, so Dan, I wonder if you could give a bit of perspective from outside of Turkey on, on such policies, you know, their mixed track record or not. Um, what the report makes clear is that Turkey is wrestling with a lot of the problems that other states in Europe especially have wrestled with. So large numbers of individuals who are returning, uh, certain hubs and communities that are at more risk than others, uh, reliance on policing, intelligence, law enforcement approaches. Um, and we're seeing that in multiple states in Europe. Uh, the ones that have tried different reintegration programs, rehabilitation programs, uh, we don't have a great track record from these. 
Uh, we have a number of programs that have been experiments, uh, but it's very hard to know which ones are actually working and if they are why they're working. And part of this is actually because of broader successes against the group. The decline of the Islamic State in the last five years, the great improvement in policing have meant that there's just been a lot less threat. So to simply compare attacks before or after or plots before and after, that's not a good measure. Uh, and it's very hard to tell whether the people who go through these programs are fundamentally changed in some ways. And the hope is that there are means short of policing that can put people on a different track, but we don't have good observations from other countries. And that's something that greatly needs to be studied is not just the prevalence of these programs, but their effectiveness and how much they can be moved across borders and work as a result. Um, thank you. I mean, we're running out of time, so I'm sorry if we don't come to everybody's question, but I wanted to uh, group together a couple of questions that had to do with um, the threat perception and kind of the change uh, that Dan walked us through at the beginning of this uh, presentation. Um, why specifically Gaziantep um, was a turning point, um, or the attack in Gaziantep was a turning point, if you could, Nagar, speak to that. Um, and why have we seen maybe a decline or have we seen a decline in tensions um, between ISIS and um, Kurdish uh, groups? Um, you know, I, I wonder if uh, um, afterwards Dan could jump in on the on the, the external dynamics there. Um, yeah, the, the, the Gaziantep police headquarters and some people that worked close with the Turkish security um, services, uh, they were civilians, but they had uh, um, more regular contact, said that it had, this Gaziantep police headquarter attack had really made the, the police force feel like they, ISIS was after them. And that that had uh, played a role in the, in the changed um, uh, threat perception or the prioritization of ISIS. But of course, it also came at the time of many other things happening. So, you know, we, we try not to, to, to um, uh, I, I think then it's not, there's not one reason. I think the coup attempt was, was also a big one. It's sort of the way, the way the security forces were, were functioning and um, sort of how joined up the different um, agencies were with each other um, uh, is also a reason, uh, the improved joined upness is also a reason that's been, uh, that's been cited. So, uh, you know, something else might have happened too that we don't know about that, that actually prompted ISIS to attack the Gazante police headquarters. You know, there, there may be reasons in, in the background as well that um, are not as um, uh, easy to know. As for the Kurds, I mean, it, it's hard to know, but when we, when we talked to some returnees' families, they told us that, that the animosity towards Kurds had been exploited by ISIS. So their sons were told that the, the PKK was going to come kill his family if he didn't join ISIS. Or you know, there was some really um, uh, some uh, graphic details that were presented by mothers and, and fathers to us that showed us that, that the Kurdish issue had been uh, prominent in the recruitment process. But you know how that relates to the conflict on the ground, um, I don't know. Um, uh, and I mean, Turkey has, has a long past uh, track record of, of, of having very different political people with very difficult, different political convictions living side by side. So somehow you know, we manage most of the time, but then when ISIS came and, and exploited it, uh, I think it, it um, uh, turned people to, uh, yeah, I'll leave it. Dan, do you want to do you want to go back to some of the external dynamics here? I mean, we've had questions about um, Turkey's involvement, obviously, in Iraq and northern Iraq, um, and how that might play on the domestic situation. So, what makes this incredibly complex, as I think most of the people on the call know, is that when we talk about you know the Kurds, for example, uh, we're really talking about different communities and different you know political organizations within this community. And so whether it's Iraqi Kurds or groups in Syria or really different um, parts of the Turkish community, you have very, very different perspectives and very, very different politics. And so in Syria, part of the reason for the animosity, of course, was the you know, single most effective local group against the Islamic State were the Syrian Kurdish organizations. And they were actively going after them. And so this back and forth was, was natural. This was you know, um, two enemies trying to kill each other. And one of the big shifts recently has been that 
the Syrian Kurds um, have other enemies. So obviously they're tremendously concerned about the Turkish incursion. The reduction in US support is of concern. Um, as the Islamic State has gotten weaker, the Syrian Kurds have started to focus on other issues. So we're seeing kind of a natural tendency to prioritize other enemies, making this all complex. Uh, Turkey has at times worked with the Iraqi Kurdish, um, some elements of the Iraqi Kurdish population, um, both against their enemies, but also against Turkey's enemies. So you have Kurds fighting against Kurds. You have different individuals from that are Turkish supported showing up in places like Libya. So it's really kind of a, a mixture of different organizations and groups. And the situation really varies radically by month, depending on the local power balance and politics. Thank you. Um, I'm, we're, we're running a bit out of time, so there are quite a number of very specific questions and we'll try to come back to those people after the call, or I do uh, encourage you to look at the report and, um, and also um, Nagar's recent report with um, our Libya analyst on the situation in Libya um, as we're trying to focus this call on, um, on the situation around Turkish ISIS returnees. Um, but I'd like to give a chance to our speakers to um, say a couple of concluding thoughts, um, given that the questions have been all over the map. It does give us a sense of what people are thinking about, um, what our, um, our, our audience is interested in. Um, Nigar, would you like to say a few words and then we'll- I mean, I, I guess I'd like- again. I'd like to close by saying you know, we by no means are trying to say there's a there's a risk right around the corner or there's sort of a situation that should be an alarm should be sounded. I mean, uh, that was not our intention. And, and I think when you read our report, you'll see that that's not the conclusion as well. Um, uh, even even the the, the the returnees who said that they, um, you know, might think of joining another caliphate um, one day to live under Sharia. You know, they you know they after they come back, they got married, they have children, they had a job. It just it it, 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 it you know I don't think even those types of citations um, necessarily speak to their um, uh, inclination to um, take up arms. Um, so we try to be nuanced on, on issues like that, um, which I, I hope you'll, you'll see when you read the report. Well, Berkai, does that mean we should just not worry about it at all, or are there other things? I, I think, well, on the policy side, I think it's still worth uh, looking into ways of developing policies in this area, also given that Turkey might be facing more returnees, uh, given the situation in Idlib and then other areas, uh, maybe from other groups. But again, as I also emphasized, maybe as a final word, as I emphasized during the presentation, I think it's really important to be modest and to keep things experimental um, in the social policy uh, sphere, because uh, having lump sum solutions of you know, a de, de radicalization policy or one disengagement policy um, um, will not work. And even like looking at it on a case by case basis um, has usually you know, more potential of success. And um, I think, you know, policy makers need to tread very carefully when they're thinking about these issues. Finally, Dan, um, as you pointed out, the whole region is, is complex and dealing with quite a lot of other um, issues going on beyond Turkey's borders. Um, if you want to tell us <laughs> your final thoughts on where, where is this all going? <laughs> so uh, I, I think that I can say with, with uh, no modesty whatsoever that I, I don't know where everything is going. But I think w what the report really highlights is this was one of the hardest problems. The question of Turkey and the Islamic State uh, was one of not only the big question marks, but one of the challenges everyone was really concerned about. And it shows to me that this is a group that, while still present and you know, active in, in dozens of countries, really in different ways, um, that it is facing a significant weakness. And that, but it also shows the contingency of all this, that so much depends on policy, so much can change, and that the turbulence of the region makes it likely that we'll see opportunities for the group to exploit. Now, whether it can exploit it as effectively as it did in the past is unlikely, but even if you look at a success story like Turkey, the report makes very clear that there's a lot of things that can go wrong and there's a lot of potential dangers. And I think we need to recognize that the Turkish government, even though it has weaknesses and problems, uh, is certainly more competent than many other governments in the region. And we're likely to see these problems show up again and again. 
Thank you. I, I just want to thank everybody, really, to all, all of our speakers and to you, the audience, um, for tuning in for this discussion. Um, hopefully, one day we'll be doing these events live again. Um, but in the meantime, uh, go to our website, be in touch. I hope we'll just continue the discussion with many of you offline. Um, and thank you again. Enjoy your morning or afternoon, wherever that is.